friends at CCC. We're going to be continuing our devotionals on particular texts on suffering, texts on suffering here. And today we're going to be covering 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Let me read this for us and then just tease out what I think is the main point in this passage. Namely, that there is a kind of suffering that exposes who you are and that refines who you are. Exposes who you are and refines who you are. Okay, so let me read this for us and then we'll begin in prayer. First Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Father, we thank you for a passage such as this. We thank you, Lord God, that you have told us as Christians that we can hope in the midst of suffering, that we shouldn't be surprised when suffering hits, and that there is a sanctifying purpose to suffering. Father, we uh, pray that you would be with us as we consider this passage here briefly and that we would be able to apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, uh, notice here that this passage talks about suffering in a little bit of a different way than the passages we covered before this, right? Passages we covered before this, we talked about the ways in which we can handle suffering. That's from the Habakkuk passage. In John 9, as we saw, there is a mysteriousness of suffering that not all suffering is punitive. It's not because of the consequence of sin, but there is a kind of suffering that God had ordained for you for the greater good, for the greater glory of his name, and for a particular calling in the blind man's life in John chapter 9, as we saw, so that we shouldn't assume that all suffering is simply punishment for our sins. And I think in this particular passage, we continue on that theme that this suffering that, that Peter is talking about here isn't punishment for a Christian sin, but I do think that what he's saying here is that all suffering, uh, particularly the sufferings that befall upon you by persecution and, and other people's malice towards you, could be used by God to sanctify you, right? Could be used by God to sanctify you, which means it, it exposes who you really are and it refines you, okay? So look at verse 6 again. In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So what is he saying there in terms of rejoicing? Well, the fact that we've been uh, born again in Jesus Christ, the fact that we have inheritance, this is the message in verses 3 to 5, that we've been born again with a living hope towards an inheritance that is waiting for us in glory. And this is the rejoicing that we have here in verse 6. We rejoice in those, those facts that have been true about us now. But now you've been grieved by various trials. And notice what he says here in verse 7. Why are we grieved by various trials? Why are we suffering here? Well, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what's he saying there? What's the purpose, as stated in verse 7, so that? Well, it's so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So notice here, what does suffering do? It tests the genuineness, the trueness of one's faith, right? So think about the analogy there that, that Peter is giving. All right, it's like gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, right? More precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire. What happens with gold when it's tested by fire, right? The dross around the gold what surrounds the gold, the impurities of the gold, are burned away. And so what is revealed is the, the core of it, the, the more pure center of the gold itself that has been purified by fire, right? And that's the sense that we have in the word sanctification too. Sanctification is to make you more pure, to make you more holy in Jesus Christ. It's a progressive thing as you walk in holiness, you grow in holiness as well. And, and here suffering is likened to this process of purification that suffering, yes, is painful, but it is a painful that will expose the gold inside. Now, we've got to be careful here. We're not saying that the gold here, right, it's just your own innate goodness or anything like that. But the gold here is, as verses 3 to 5 has told us, the power of being born again. This is the, by virtue of Christ's grace, giving you the Holy Spirit, allowing you to have true faith in God. This is by grace alone. And this 
power of being born again, this new seed of life that is within you, will be made clear for what it is, that you have been born again in Jesus Christ. How is this made clear? By how you handle suffering, by how you go through suffering. And that's why it's so painful, just as fire purifies the gold, so does suffering purify you. And so if you're truly gold, in other words, if you truly have the gift of being born again by the Spirit, you will survive this, and you will maintain your faith. But if you're not born again, suffering will likely turn you away from Jesus Christ. So suffering is kind of creating a fork in the road that exposes who you really are. It doesn't make you bitter or make you into a Christian or anything like that. But actually here in this context, Peter is saying it exposes who you really are. A lot of people claim to be Christians, right? And they claim to be having true faith in God until real suffering comes their way. You know, malice, betrayals, life happens, and then they suffer. And because of that suffering, they turn their backs from God and they walk away. So suffering exposes who they truly are. They, they expose the fact that their words are not tethered to their lives. Or on the other hand, right, you have uh, suffering that actually purifies you such that you're really vindicated for who you really are. You've, you've always said you've had faith in God, but the suffering that comes your way actually shows you to really be genuine in what you have said about your faith, right? And I think one great example of this is uh, Tim Keller's recent notification about his battle with cancer. He's, he's notified through, through social media and, and through various means that he has, is battling cancer once again. I think this is not his first time he has battled cancer. And at an older age, of course, this is alarming for a lot of us. And here's what he said in response to the fact that he's facing chemotherapy now. He's going through some real pain and suffering in his life. Here's what he says in a post. He says, our situation has driven us to see God's face as we never before. He is giving us more of his sense presence, more freedom from our besetting sins, more dependence on his word, things that we had sought for years, but only under these circumstances of battling with cancer, right? Are we finding them? What's he saying there? He's saying, all right, suffering comes your way. Cancer comes your way. What would that do to your character? Would that cause you to be wrangling only in bitterness, causing you to leave God? Or would it cause you to cling on God more? And that's exactly what you prioritize, not your physical health per se, but the fact that the losing of your physical health might cause you to, to, to sense God's presence more, to cling upon God more. And you're saying to yourself like killer is, right? If you can cling to God in that way, if you can feel that presence more, if you can leave your sins in a more holistic way, and if, it, if that means that gaining these things means losing my health, then let me lose my health. I count all things for not compared to knowing Christ. And that's exactly what Peter here is saying, right? When suffering comes your way, will you say to yourself, this is a good thing, not that suffering itself is good, but it's, it's good in so far as it produces a good effect in me, namely that my faith can be made all the more pure, that the tested genuineness of it could be made clear, and I could therefore gain more of Christ in that way, right? So that when he returns, we will be found to result in praise and glory. But not only that, verse 8, though now you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. That in the midst of that suffering that you have, and your, your faith is tested, yes, but it will be proven genuine. And you can feel this inexpressible joy. This joy that is filled with glory, even in the midst of it. Not, not, not in the absence of suffering, but precisely because of suffering, you feel this joy. And like what Keller is saying there, it's worth it. Man. If this is what it means to, to believe in God more, to have faith in God more, to overcome my sins all the more, but it does mean suffering, then let me embrace it. Not because suffering in itself is good, but because of its product. I, I, am, I, I prioritize and I privilege my fellowship with God more than I do my own comfort. That's the attitude of the Christian because we've been saved by grace. This becomes a gift of us, right? This, this is, we love the fact that we have the Savior and if suffering brings us closer to him, then we would embrace that outcome. I hope this has been helpful for you, friends. Amen.